Uh, and welcome to the 21st meeting in 2018 of the Finance and Constitution Committee. I could just remember everybody to put their mobile phones on silent, so don't disturb any of the proceedings. Uh, the only item on our agenda today is to take evidence on the European Union Withdrawal Act from the Secretary of State for Scotland. David Mundell, Secretary for Scotland, I very much warmly welcome you to our meeting this morning. Uh, but before we move to the questions um, to the, to, from the Committee, Secretary of State, do you want to make a short opening statement? Thank you, convener, and I'm very pleased to uh, be here this morning. I would like to just make a short uh, opening statement before we move uh, to uh, questions. Uh, since I was last before this committee back in May, there have been a number of developments. One of the most significant is that the EU withdrawal bill is now an act. I do deeply regret that the Scottish Parliament felt unable to give consent to this important piece of legislation. To the very end, we worked constructively with the Scottish Government and Welsh Government to reach agreement. It is, of course, worth being clear that the significant changes we made to the legislation were a result of discussions between officials and ministers in all administrations, and indeed the feedback uh, from this committee, MPs and the House of Lords. The Welsh Government and Assembly were able to support the final agreement. Unfortunately, the Scottish Government were unable to do the same. But throughout, the UK Government upheld our commitment to the devolution settlements and associated conventions and acted within their parameters. We remain com fully committed to devolution and will continue to seek legislative consent, take on board views and work with the devolved administrations on bills according to the established practices. We have worked well with the Scottish Government in the past and we must ensure that we continue to work well together in the future. The progress we've made and are making on UK common frameworks is testament to this, and I hope is indicative of our future relationship. I'm satisfied with the level of engagement. UK officials are in contact with their counterparts in the devolved administrations every single day, uh, discussing our preparations for exit. For example, since January, over 30 further deep dive policy sessions between UK government and devolved administration officials have been held as part of the first phase of engagement on future common frameworks. A second phase of deep dives is now currently underway. Discussions are also progressing on a range of cross-cutting issues, including the approach on trade, the internal market and governance. All of this is being guided by the framework principles agreed by all administrations at the JMCEN, which is now going to proceed on a scheduled monthly basis. Since we last met, the UK Government has set out for our vision for the United Kingdom outside uh, the EU. The Government has also set out its plans for legislating for the withdrawal agreement in a white paper. We shared information on this paper with the Scottish Government at the JMCN in July, well in advance of its publication. We are also, alongside the devolved administrations, taking forward a review of the existing intergovernmental structures, which I know is a matter of great importance to this uh, committee, and the MOU uh, that uh, is currently in existence, and officials will report back to the JMCP in due course. With the passage of the EU Withdrawal Act, we now have confidence that our laws will function after exit. The work over the summer to publish a series of technical notices will help prepare businesses, individuals and families in the unlikely event that we exit without a deal. As we exit the EU convener, I remain committed to working collaboratively with the Scottish Government, this committee and this Parliament. Uh, thank you, Secretary of State, for that opening uh, remarks. Um, on Common Framework, Secretary of State, um, when you gave evidence to this committee on the 8th of November last year, you told us in relation to agreeing Common Frameworks, and I quote here, very clear that it's not possible to... I, will, I am very clear that it will not be possible to achieve legislative consent and agreement from the Scottish Government unless we've agreed the process by which those frameworks will be agreed. And in further evidence, on the 3rd of May this year, you reaffirmed that we are not in the business of imposing frameworks. Why then, Secretary of State, did your government proceed without the consent of this parliament? And more importantly, perhaps now, will you now give a guarantee that no common frameworks will be imposed? I think, uh, as we've um, discussed previously at this committee and in uh, other discussions, there is a degree of conflation of issues uh, uh, there. The EU withdrawal 
Act as it now is was about uh, the, op the possibility of freezing existing EU uh, arrangements until uh, new agreements had been uh, reached. That, that is what a, uh, Clause 12, as it now is, of that Act is about. It's not about the process for agreeing the frameworks. So my position on agreeing the frameworks is the same as I've previously stated. I want us to be in a position where we are able to reach agreement on those frameworks, those new arrangements that will apply once we leave the EU. I believe we're actually making very good progress uh, in doing that. There's a lot of work uh, underway uh, at the moment, some of which I've outlined uh, in my opening statement. And that's, you know, that's the big change I've, I've said before. It's the big change about leaving the EU. Matters which were previously agreed with the EU by the UK will now have to be agreed within uh, the UK. I, I drew these two matters together, Secretary of State, because it's pretty obvious and everyone knows that in Clause 11 that you proceeded, the UK government proceeded to put in place without the consent of this Parliament. And now I'm seeking to ensure that you can give a guarantee today that there will be no common frameworks imposed in future. Um, given that that's the history we're dealing with, I'm now trying to look forward to see how we're going to deal with these common frameworks, and I'm seeking a guarantee from you that no common frameworks will be imposed on Scotland. I don't, obviously, uh, to some extent, accept the premise of the question, because no common framework has been uh, imposed uh, on uh, Scotland. Uh, the provisions of the EU withdrawal bill Clause 12, as it's, as it's become, Clause 11, as it was, uh, allow for existing arrangements to be frozen uh, whilst there is a negotiation of new uh, agreements. It is still absolutely my position, the, the UK government position, that we want to reach those frameworks by agreement. If no agreement is reached, will a common framework be imposed? We don't want uh, to be in a position where we don't uh, have uh, agreement. We want to be in a position where we, we reach you know, agreement. And that's uh, what we've sought to do throughout the, the process that actually uh, involved uh, the EU uh, with, withdrawal bill. And I think, actually, if we focus on the issues... You know, the issues that are being covered, the very important issues to people in Scotland, like agriculture, like fisheries, and not the issues of process and, and whether or not uh, the constitutional arrangements within uh, the United Kingdom uh, need to be changed or whether or not we agree uh, what uh, the interpretation of those arrangements are, I'm confident we can uh, reach agreement because everybody has a common interest in, in doing so. I think, you know, if, if we've an issue I've, I've raised before, the uh, movement of livestock within uh, Great Britain, I think uh, all Scottish Government, UK Government, uh, Welsh Assembly Government, you know, I, I, I don't see a basis on which uh, they wouldn't uh, be able to reach agreement. Well, like you, Secretary of State, I'm also interested in the content in the common framework, it's not the process, and it's the content I'm concentrating on, because that's, well, that's where there will either be agreement or not agreement, and I'm seeking for you to provide a guarantee that if, that if, that none of these, if there's no agreement, that none of these common frameworks will be imposed. In the um, legislation, I mean, it, the, the process for agreeing the common, common frameworks was not part of that, uh, was, was not part of the EU uh, withdrawal bill. So we are still going through um, an evolution of what uh, that process will be, but it will be a process about reaching agreement, agreement across the United Kingdom. Now, we may uh, differ, and uh, we have in relation uh, to uh, the, the role you know, of the Scottish Parliament in determining what happens in other uh, parts of the United Kingdom, because I'm quite clear that the Scottish Parliament doesn't have uh, a veto over what would happen uh, in other parts of uh, the United Kingdom. But I am determined that in relation to what happens in Scotland, in relation uh, to devolved matters, that that proceeds on the basis of agreement. OK, well, I've tried to secure that guarantee, but obviously I've not been able to to get to the position I hoped to manage to get to today. Alexander, I think you were interested in common frameworks as well. 
Uh, thank you very much, Camille. I was really just, most of that's been covered, but I just wondered if there's any timetable for the completion of a common framework that so you're able to share. There isn't, a, there isn't a timetable as such, and in fact it was agreed uh, by um, the JMCEN that a um, work uh, would carry on across the whole of, of these 24 areas uh, pretty much in, a, in unison. A, um, but clearly there are some areas where there's a need uh, for a degree of priority uh, because uh, of the impact of leaving the EU, and the two obvious ones there are fishing and agriculture, because when we leave uh, the EU, we'll leave the common fisheries policy, and when we leave the, um, when we leave the um, common agricultural policy, obviously, the, the, there are practical consequences um, of, of doing that. So uh, very shortly, for example, the UK government will be bringing forward an agriculture bill, which we've been in discussion with the Scottish government uh, about, which will relate to some very specific aspects, i.e., the for example, the capacity to continue uh, to pay uh, farmers once we've left uh, the EU. It won't necessarily set out um, detailed policy frameworks. So some aspects of what might be regarded as a common framework would be dealt with in that bill. Some would be dealt with in a forthcoming fisheries bill. However, other aspects might be dealt with in revisals to the existing concordat that exists on fisheries. So whilst there isn't a, a, a timetable that says, uh, that lists these um, 24 areas in an order, there, is, there are practical circumstances which mean that uh, certain things will happen ahead of other, other things. Thank you very much. Emma, do you want to ask questions? Common frameworks at this stage? Or is there... Just a quick one about fishing. Thank you, convener. Um, Scotland does have a, a difference in fishing industry compared to the GDP of fishing in the UK. So as we're um, negotiating to look at common frameworks, so um, I'm interested that like the words expendable have been used in the past with fishing. So can you give us a 100% guarantee that that fishing won't be expended and, or that we have a 100% guarantee that frameworks won't be imposed on our fishing industry? Well, I, I think, again, um, you know, there, there are a number of issues uh, um, in, the, in there. The government is absolutely clear that in leaving the EU, we will be leaving uh, the common fisheries policy and becoming an independent coastal state uh, which will... Uh, which will have the capacity to negotiate our own fishing uh, arrangements, and, and that is uh, the position. It is not, ex it, you know, it's not acceptable to me, uh, and it is not, and, and it is the Prime Minister has made it clear not acceptable to her to leave the EU on the basis uh, that there would be some pre-negotiated uh, uh, arrangement as in relation to EU uh, fishing. A, um, a fishing access to, to UK waters. Uh, and that's also why we, we, we uh, to, uh, have uh, left um, the London uh, Agreement a, a, as well. In relation to a, uh, matters within a, um, the, the UK, uh, then you know, the, there'll be no change to the existing uh, uh, the existing uh, arrangements, the existing uh, responsibilities uh, exercised uh, within a, uh, here in the Scottish Parliament and within a, a Scotland, and they fully do recognise the fact that fishing is significantly uh, more important, as you've said, to the economy of Scotland. And fishing, fishing I, I met with the Scottish Fishermen's Federation uh, this week. I met with Sir Ian Wood, who takes a very uh, ex extensive uh, interest in uh, fishing also this uh, week. And uh, I've recently met the processors. And everybody in the fishing industry is excited by the opportunities uh, uh, that can arise uh, from uh, Scotland leaving uh, the common fisheries policy. And I think that's what we all need to focus on, is, is allowing those opportunities to be uh, maximised, and I'm absolutely committed to doing that. Patrick, on consent matters. Thank you, convener. Good morning. Um, I wanted to draw a connection further between the the issues the convener was raising and the issue of legislative consent, because the the desire to reach agreement on any of these matters, the way in which agreement is reached, is is still a, a really big 
problem in this. If, if one side, one party in a discussion holds open the option to impose rather than reaching an agreement, that's a barrier in itself to agreement. You're only going to get reasonable compromise and negotiation if both parties need an agreement uh, in, instead of holding open the option for, for imposing something. So I'm, I'm still very concerned that we're almost inevitably going to have further conflicts on issues like legislative consent in that in that context. We've we've just had a huge disagreement about legislative consent. We we would like to avoid others. I think most of us would like to avoid others. You said you want to continue to seek legislative consent on devolved issues. Isn't it reasonable then that we need a a clear and mutual understanding of what the legislative consent principle is? And in particular, when it says the UK government shall not normally legislate in devolved areas, don't we need a mutually agreeable understanding of what not normally means? And we don't have one at the moment. At a, um, the, the outset, I, 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 want, I agree with the, the, <clears throat> the principles that you've, you've set out. And um, that's why this week I was very pleased uh, that the, the Scottish government uh, moved forward to uh, bring forward legislative can consent in relation to the offensive weapons a uh, bill a uh, uh, which is uh, which is is proceeding through a uh, uh, the uk uh, uh, parliament uh, at the moment and for example covers you know, acid attacks and these uh, these um uh, these sort of vile offenses the the legislative consent was forthcoming and it's been legislative we've we've sought legislative consent legislative consent uh, motions have been lodged in a range of other uh, areas involving lasers involving some changes mm. to a, uh, a, a, a ability to park on the pavement in Scotland, which I know is a, is a matter of great import to people here in Edinburgh. So I, but, um, but you're, you're smiling you because know, you recognise that's not a hugely divisive issue. No, I, I'm, it's I'm, where it, the it's not a huge. It's not a, no, that we have a problem. It, it, I accept that's not a hugely divisive issue, Mr. Harvey, but it it it, it, it does give it does I think. Uh, support the fact that the whole process hasn't broken down. I mean, there's, you know, there was some suggestion that the whole process uh, w w was going to break down uh, because uh, um, the UK government had, had rode roughshod over it, and, and that's just not, you know, that's yeah. not the case. We do have. It's clear between uh, certainly the Scottish government and ourselves and. A most independent observers, a difference of opinion as to what um, the Seoul Convention meant, because I, I, I've had it quoted at me that the Seoul Convention was an absolute provision, no, no. and, and a, uh, therefore that it was not, a, a, and therefore the Seoul Convention had had been breached simply by the fact that we had uh, proceeded. It hadn't. It was very clear back. Uh, in, in, in 1998, uh, when the, the original convention emerged, the, the, the Westminster Parliament would always be able to legislate on devolved matters. The, the, the fact that it's, it's working all right on relatively low-level, non-contentious, non-divisive issues, that's the easy stuff. We have a lot of very contentious, very divisive issues that we're going to have to debate over the, the coming months and perhaps years. And so we need a mutually agreeable process that can deal with those. Can I, can I put it to you that the UK government's position on what this caveat of not normally within the consent mechanism means is incoherent? The, the situation in Northern Ireland, for example, is that there is no normal devolution process at the moment. The Assembly hasn't been meeting for a year and a half. It doesn't look likely to meet at the moment. You have a majority of Supreme Court judges in a recent case saying the existing law on abortion is incompatible with human rights law. You've got a large majority of public opinion in Northern Ireland uh, supporting reform in precisely the situations that were considered in that Supreme Court case. Uh, you've got the UN... Committee on the Elimination of Discrimination uh, Against Women, saying that the situation in Northern Ireland constitutes a grave and systematic violation of human rights. Uh, and even though we don't have a normal devolution functioning system in Northern Ireland, uh, the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland says that the issue is devolved, uh, and because of that, 
Uh, the government believed the question of any future reform in Northern Ireland must be debated and decided by the people of Northern Ireland and their locally elected and therefore accountable politicians. But contrast that with Scotland, where devolution is working normally, where the Scottish Parliament is legislating normally. There is, there is a willingness to say that you can legislate on devolved issues. Don't we need to reach a consistent, coherent understanding of what this caveat means? Because it surely can't just mean when a devolved assembly does something the UK government doesn't like, you'll overrule it. It can't mean that. Well, I deal with a number of points. I, 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 from the uh, look on the convener's face, I won't dwell too long on Northern Ireland, other than it's to say that, 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 that we have, you know, we do have an asymmetric system of devolution within the, within the United Kingdom. There are those people, and I respect the view. I don't agree with it. But I respect the view of people who argue for you know a federal and and more a, um, a, a you know a, a, a greater symmetry uh, within the system. So that Northern Ireland uh, ha has very um, unique uh, issues. Uh, I think w one thing we would agree on is you know the government's priority to get the Northern Ireland executive back up and running because that is the best way in, in order to take forward issues there. The, the devolution arrangements for Scotland you know, are, are different from those arrangements for Northern Ireland and indeed for Wales are set out uh, in, a, um, in, in the Scotland Act as, as uh, variously uh, amended from which the Sewell Convention uh, emerged. Now, I don't agree with you that over the last 19 years there haven't been contentious and difficult issues that have been debated and discussed in this parliament, that this parliament hasn't taken decisions at various times uh, which UK governments of different persuasions did not agree with. But at no point, at no point uh, uh, did they ever uh, interfere with those, uh, interfere with those uh, uh, decisions. This was a case where the UK government put forward proposals uh, as t in relation to a, uh, the management of our uh, departure uh, from the EU and the certainty in our legal system after we left uh, the EU on which we, we couldn't uh, reach agreement. We did not overrule uh, any uh, action of uh, the Scottish Parliament. You legislated in the devolved area without the consent of the Scottish Parliament. What does not normally mean? It means that for 19 years we, and continuing, we will seek the consent of the Scottish Parliament to legislate in those areas. And that's what we're absolutely committed to doing. Whether I like it or not, we've got a problem here. And we need to try to find some way to resolve this problem. Because the Scottish Government have said very clearly that as far as Brexit-related legislation is concerned, that they will not recommend consent in any of that legislation until they're and this is my words, not theirs, a resetting of the Sewell Convention process. That's where we are. What's the UK government's proposals to break that logjam? My, my position, uh, Mr Crawford, is you know, we've made a decision on this. We made a decision in September 2014 because we had a referendum on whether Scotland became independent or remained part of the United Kingdom. And I remember taking part in debates, I remember taking part in a debate with, Mr. Uh, with uh, Professor Tompkins uh, uh, um, on the same side, it has to be said, when there was a, uh, when, you know, there was an extensive discussion by members of the audience about the Sewell Convention and about Westminster's relative powers to the Scottish Parliament. I mean, we've had you know, we've had that. A, uh, we've we've had that uh, debate. That that is part of the, the you know, that is part of the debate around the existing constitutional arrangement. Now, I do I understand and I respect and I respect you know I respect your position, uh, which you've argued for many uh, consistently for many years uh, in relation to changing the constitution. Of, of, the, of the United Kingdom. I respect, you know, I, I respect Listen, I'm, being, I respect very, I'm being very narrow in this, actually. I'm not, this is not about, the, this is not about anything to do with independence or 2014. This is about the current arrangements of devolution. Yes. And if we've got a government in Scotland that's saying they're not going to recommend to its parliament any consent in any Brexit legislation because they believe that a bit of the system is not working, the Sewell Convention, Patrick's quite rightly pointed to not normally. We've got a problem in the current settlement, and we've got to find some way 
to sort that problem, or otherwise, unless you're prepared to guarantee today, it's potentially the UK government's going to go ahead with other Brexit legislation without the consent of the Scottish Parliament. That's not good. That's not our intention. And so you, you guarantee know, I think you won't do that. I, it's not. It's, it's not our. A intention. I, I don't think that you know. I, I don't think it was a helpful statement uh, uh, to make. But uh, I, I, you know, we'll, we'll, we, we have yet uh, uh, to see what that uh, it, you know what that emerges. I, I, from my reading of Mr. Russell's uh, evidence yesterday, it wasn't a hundred percent clear to me that that was an absolute yeah, a uh, an absolute position. Yeah. I mean, we're having, you know, we are in the middle of, of detailed discussions at a, uh, the moment in relation to both these agriculture uh, and fisheries uh, bills. You know, I, I remain hopeful uh, that, the, the, that the Scottish Government will come forward with uh, legislative consent in relation to these uh, bills. So, in a sense, a, uh, well... We, we've, we find us, we have to deal with the situations that we, that we find uh, ourselves in. But I, do, I, I think that we can, uh, we can continue uh, to find agreement if we focus on the issues, not if we remain, uh, you know, in a position which is clear uh, of having different views of the constitution uh, of uh, Scotland. Well, I think all we're doing, frankly, Secretary of State, in these circumstances is parking a problem for the future that's going to keep coming back now that it's, now that it's, in, in, and now that it's out in the open. And we've got to find some way to resolve this, otherwise we're going to be back in these conflicts time and time again. Anyway, can, can, and actually, that probably takes us into the area that Adam Tompkins was interested in. Thank you, uh, Kavina. But before I get into the area that I wanted to um, explore with the Secretary of State, perhaps I can just pick up directly on, on what you were just um, talking, uh, talking about with him. Uh, I mean, the, the view that's been very forcefully expressed by the convener and by Mr Harvey is that there is a problem with the Steel Convention that needs some kind of fix. Is it the view of the United Kingdom government that there is a problem with the Steel Convention, or is it the view of the United Kingdom government that Steel was adhered to um, uh, in the passing of the Withdrawal Act? I'm absolutely clear that Steel was adhered to in, in the passing uh, of uh, the Act, and I think a lot of the complaint in relation to it is about, you know, it, 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 it is about a difference in uh, a wish uh, for our constitution. It, 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 it's not that people don't like the Sewell Convention, it's, it's, uh, or that there's a problem with it. It's just uh, that that's not the constitutional arrangement. Uh, that they want to be applying in the United Kingdom at this time. So, the, so the, as I understand it, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, but as I understand it, the position of the United Kingdom government um, is that the United Kingdom will continue to adhere to the Sewell Convention. The United Kingdom government will continue to seek um, the consent of the devolved um, parliaments and assemblies of the United Kingdom um, w w where UK legislation relates to devolved matters or relates to the powers of the parliaments and assemblies. Um, uh, and that the United Kingdom Parliament will not normally be invited to legislate on matters touching on devolution without that consent. That's absolutely the position. So um, what is the UK government's re reaction then to not just the convener of this committee and Mr Harvey and others very forcefully expressing a contrary view, but to the Scottish government itself expressing a contrary view that Sewell is broken and, 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 ne and needs to be fixed? Well, I'm, 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 as I said in my opening remarks, I mean, I'm disappointed how things emerged during um, the EU um, withdrawal uh, bill, as it then was, discussions. And, you know, I think probably, and, and, and some of the discussions we had at this committee, I mean, it would have been a lot clearer earlier on if we, had, if we actually had understood um, that the Scottish Government did have this absolutist position in relation to... Uh, the, the interpretation of consent within yeah. uh, the Sewell uh, Convention. Yeah. Uh, I don't think their interpretation of the Sewell Convention is correct. Yeah. Um, but I don't, you know, I don't think uh, farmers, fishermen, people affected by the environmental measures that uh, are going to come to Scotland uh, after we leave the EU, you know. I, I, I don't think that they are really focused on us being involved in one of these 
you know, um, analysis of uh, uh, repeated analysis of the Seoul Convention. They're interested in what the measures are that emerge. And I think that if you know, if if we can lift our horizons from the constant constitutional row, yeah. I, we can actually move forward on these issues. And that's why I'm actually much more confident that we can reach agreement on the frameworks, the substantive policy issues. Uh, because that is actually the, the track record, and although Mr. Harvey might suggest that you know the offensive weapons bill is a rather sort of easy and, and minor thing uh, to deal with, it's actually a very significant uh, piece of, of, of legislation to protect the public, on which we've been able to, to reach agreement. In, in, indeed, I, I would I would share that view. Um, uh, the um, I don't know, Secretary of State, how much you've been able to look at the um, uh, evidence that we took yesterday from uh, Michael Russell, um, but he was asked at the end of that session um, uh, exactly what um, he means when he says that the Scottish Government is no longer going to cooperate with the Sewell process. And it turns out that he hasn't ruled out the possibility that there will be a supplementary legislative consent memorandum with regard to the trade bill. Um, he hasn't ruled out the possibility that there will be future legislative memorandums. And indeed, I understand from the standing orders that there's a requirement on the Scottish Government to produce legislative consent memorandums. Um, but what he has suggested is that he won't be putting before the Scottish Parliament legislative consent motions. Now, it seems to me, and I'd be interested in your view on this, it seems to me that if that's the case, the Scottish Government will continue to publish legislative consent memorandums, but the Scottish Parliament will somehow be denied the opportunity to vote um, affirmatively or negatively on legislative consent motions, then all that we're left with is that the UK government won't know whether the Scottish government consents, sorry, whether the Scottish Parliament consents um, to UK legislation touching on devolved matters or not. We'll, we'll know the Scottish government's view, that'll be in the memorandum, but we won't know the Scottish Parliament's view because that could only be determined by a vote on the motion. And if the Scottish government isn't going to isn't going to put those motions before the Parliament, then we're just left in a situation where the United Kingdom government, um, as it were, can carry on because the uh, Scottish Parliament will be denied the opportunity, should it wish to take such an opportunity, to say that it doesn't give consent. Is that is that your understanding of what Mr. Russell said yesterday? I, I, well, firstly, let me say it would be a very you know that would be a very dis disappointing uh, outcome. I mean, I, I you know I've always uh, you know placed equal importance on the views of the Parliament and the Scottish Government and sought as we've gone through this process and indeed other processes to ensure uh, that this Parliament was, was fully uh, engaged in that and I, I think it would be extremely disappointing if we got to a situation where the Scottish Parliament itself was not able uh, to express uh, a view because from time to time even Mr Russell concedes that the Scottish Government doesn't have a majority uh, in uh, the Scottish Parliament. Yeah, well, of course that's not my view that, the, you know, that we should be not, not having any further mm -hmm. debate on legislative consent motions, but it's, it's, it's mm -hmm. my interpretation yeah, of what I think Mr Russell said um, yesterday representing the, the Scottish Government. It does seem very, um, um, it seems an evolving um, position. Can I, can I move away from the detail of Stuart into, into the broader... Yeah, but before you do, Patrick has got a supplementary on that specific point. I, I think there is just one thing that's. Sure. I think there is just one thing that's important to add, add to that that point, both for the for the record uh, and for the benefit of of anyone who may be listening, members of the public who may be listening to this discussion. Questionable judgment for them to do that, but the the Scottish Parliament is not and won't be in a position where it's unable uh, to have those questions put. Uh, I'm, I'm sure Mr uh, Mundell can empathise with a, a minority government, uh, but the, the Scottish Government cannot dictate to the Scottish Parliament what issues it wants to decide. The Parliamentary Bureau will make those decisions. And can I just reinforce to you that I, you're asking for us to move beyond these constitutional uh, and processy kind of questions. Surely the way for us to do that is to reach an agreed, shared understanding of what the Sewell Convention means and the way this phrase not normally is to be interpreted rather than the UK government simply satisfying itself that it, it agrees with itself. I don't know if you want to make, make a comment on well, that. Well, that, was a, I, that was a statement rather than a I, question. I've noted, you know, I, I, I've noted uh, Mr Harvey's views. I respect his views, but I don't agree with them. Sorry to interrupt you, Mr Tompkins. No, not at all. Um, uh, um, uh, Secretary State, I wanted to move away from the detail of, of Sewell um, towards the uh, broader issue of intergovernmental uh, co cooperation and you, you said in your opening remarks I think that um, we're now or you're now embarking on 
um, deep deep dives round two or deeper dives. Um, um, and um, could you just flesh that out a bit for us? What, what, what is being dived into in these um, exercises and how is the process of cooperation working? Is it working at official level? Is it working at ministerial level or both? Well, it, it, I, I think it's, you know, I, I think a, um, that, it, that it's working a, at a, a both, a both uh, levels. Um, in relation to, to the deep dives, what, the, what it primarily has been about is about identifying within those 24 areas which might require legislation and which might be subject to other forms of agreement. In fact, moving certain areas from the overall heading uh, in, in terms of uh, the 24 legislative framework areas into actually uh, the other 80-odd areas where uh, there wasn't going to be a legislative framework. And indeed, these powers, which will come directly uh, to um, the, the Scottish uh, Parliament. So that it's, it's about a refining down to what might be required to be dealt by with by primary legislation, secondary legislation, or indeed uh, be the subject of uh, less formal uh, arrangements such as um, the uh, fishing uh, concordat, which I mentioned in, in response to Emma Harper's mm. Uh, question. So it act, it's, that that's what it's about, and quite a, uh, it's, it's about a refining down, uh, uh, and, and that's where a lot of the work um, has been. But we've since um, we last uh, met uh, in, this, uh, in, in this committee uh, established the ministerial forum, which is an offshoot essentially of the GMCN, which is a, a less formal. Uh, environment uh, which allows the discussion between ministers uh, of uh, various of, of the issues. And my colleagues Chloe Smith from uh, the Cabinet Office and Robin Walker from DEXU uh, 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 represent the UK government at that. And we've had a, a number of meetings of that forum uh, with Scottish government uh, ministers. And then that reports back into the JC, JMCN. And we have taken on board uh, I think a legitimate uh, point uh, which was uh, raised by uh, Mr uh, Russell about ensuring a regularity of, of meetings uh, of, of the JMCN. So we're now going to proceed on a scheduled uh, basis for, for meetings of, of, of the JMCN. Thank you. That's, that's very helpful. Final question for me on this. The, 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 um, to what extent, if at all, does the um, distinction between reserved powers and devolved powers play into how the process of intergovernmental cooperation is working. And I ask that question because yesterday we took evidence both from George Hollingbury for the UK government and from Mike Russell for the Scottish government on the on the trade bill. And the trade bill clearly, I mean, the United Kingdom government is seeking legislative consent from this parliament, but the most of the trade bill and the core of the subject of the trade bill is clearly about reserved competence. It's about international relations, international treaties and international trade, all of which are clearly uh, reserved um, under, the, uh, under the Scotland Act. And we heard from the Minister of Trade that notwithstanding the fact that we're talking about essentially reserved competence, he wants a cooperative um, and consultative approach uh, with the Scottish Government uh, and with um, other devolved administrations in the United Kingdom. And then we heard in contrast to that, um, from Mike Russell that he wants a whole series of vetoes that he himself can exercise uh, in the in in in, in the um, as re these reserve competences are rolled out because you know whereas a year ago he was saying that Brexit must be delivered in a manner that is compatible with the devolution settlement now he's saying that Brexit must be delivered uh, and Brexit Bre Bre that the devolution settlement cannot bear the weight um, of Brexit I think he said yesterday and, and there are bits of the devolution settlement that now need to be changed because he doesn't he doesn't like them and in particular he doesn't like the fact that international trade is is, is reserved is that so is that distinction between that which is devolved and that which is reserved getting in the way of effective intergovernmental cooperation for example on um, uh, the future common frameworks that might relate to trade it's, it's not on a on a practical level and again this is an example where the governments have worked well together in, in relation to trade. Uh, in, in relation to trade matters, I've travelled uh, um, 
uh, to a number of uh, overseas markets, for example, I was in uh, Tokyo earlier in the year, UK government, Scottish government working very, very closely, a, um, the Department of International Trade, Scottish Development International working very hard together to secure the best outcome for Scotland. You know, and that's, uh, that, that's what you want to uh, see and achieve. And actually, if you speak to those people on the ground, you know, they have no idea of the constitutional minutiae Indeed. that we are arguing. They are looking to bring businesses to Scotland, to invest in Scotland, or to sell Scottish products around the world. And that's our approach. That's what we want, you know, we want to achieve. So we don't delineate uh, in that way. Of course, ultimately, in terms of reaching uh, trade agreements, those are reserved matters. Uh, within the, the devolution settlement, and the UK uh, will be the entity that negotiates those matters. But we've absolutely committed, and Mr Hollandbury did yesterday, Liam Fox has done, the Prime Minister has done, for engagement with Scottish Government, Welsh Assembly Government, hopefully a Northern Ireland executive, in uh, reaching those, uh, uh, those agreements. And th you know, that's the approach that, that we take. I think that that can be perfectly uh, well uh, accommodated uh, in the devolution settlement. But again, it comes back to focusing on the issue in hand. And the issue in hand is to get the best possible trade deals uh, for Scotland and the UK and to achieve the maximum amount of inward investment uh, into Scotland uh, internationally. And that, I'm afraid that isn't uh, determined by constitutional minutiae. It's determined by the effectiveness of your trade policies. Thanks very much. Murdo Fraser on seasonal workers. Uh, yeah, thanks, Convener. Um, this is not on the on the constitutional details, more looking at the, the wider aspects of Brexit. And one of the issues post Brexit we've heard quite a lot about is concerns about access to, to migrant labour. And it's been a major issue in uh, places like Perthshire and Fife, where I represent, where farmers have been concerned about access to seasonal workers. And I noticed there was an announcement this morning, I think, from the Home Office around a seasonal uh, agricultural worker scheme. I wondered if you could maybe just outline briefly for us how that's going to work. Yes, I, I can. It's, it's a pilot, and, and I, want, I would begin by, be, obvious, by paying uh, tribute uh, to uh, my colleague Kirsten Hare, the new MP for Angus, because obviously Angus, as you know, is, is, is re, uh, you, may, you may suggest Persia, but Angus I, uh, has such a central role in the soft fruit uh, industry. and. A, uh, Kirsten has sought really to highlight that, along with others, um, uh, to the, the, the government and the need uh, for a, uh, an ability to bring in non-EEA nationals, because I was very struck myself when I met the industry about the, the, the need for non-EEA nationals to be able to come in uh, to the UK. because regardless of, of the issues around Brexit, the number of EU nationals coming in to uh, support the, the, the horticulture and agriculture had been uh, dropping for a range of reasons. So this scheme will allow 2,500 uh, places for visas to support uh, agriculture and uh, horticulture. It's a pilot, uh, and as such, therefore, I believe it's a, it's a first step. Uh, in, in moving forward with the support uh, that the industry uh, has sought and uh, requires. Of course, EU nationals uh, will still be able to come to the UK uh, until uh, the end of the implementation period in uh, December 2020 on the same basis as they do today. Okay, and, and the scheme will come in from next spring, is that it's right? It's in, in the spring uh, 2019, but I can, I'm very happy to write to the yeah. committee with, with the exact details of it. Okay. On the wider issues then, um, Neil. Thanks, Convener. Good morning, Secretary of State. Um, you said earlier that a no deal was unlikely. Um, however, I think it's fair to say over recent months since the Chequers proposal, uh, the likelihood of a, a no deal has become more likely. Um, the International Trade Secretary said the chance of a no deal is actually 60-40, um, and which makes it more likely than not, in, 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 in according to those maths. So, do you believe the International Trade Secretary is wrong in, in that uh, in that guess? And what, in percentage terms, how unlikely do you think a no-deal Brexit is, given that you think it's unlikely? Well, I'm not going to uh, um, I'm not going to uh, accept your invitation to guess. 
Uh, what I want to do is to get a deal. I don't want there to be uh, a no-deal uh, scenario. I want there to be a deal. And I believe that the Chequers proposal, which the Prime Minister uh, has put forward and which was outlined uh, in the White Paper, which uh, was published uh, in July, is the best opportunity to get a deal which is good for Scotland and good for the United Kingdom. And that deal, which I think is that proposal, which I think is worth noting, uh, because we have previously discussed in this um, in this forum the Scotland's place in Europe, parts one and two, that many of the aspects of the proposals put forward by the Scottish Government are actually covered uh, in a, uh, the Chequers uh, proposal. So I think the Chequers proposal is the best way to achieve a deal, and I think it would help uh, to get a deal if everyone across the United Kingdom felt able to rally behind the Prime Minister in her negotiations for that deal. Well, I, mean, I want to see a, a sensible and, and a serious deal with the European Union, but it's, you know, it obviously appears there's a difference of opinion between uh, ministers on how likely or unlikely a, a deal uh, will be reached. Um, the UK Government have obviously said they're planning for a no deal, and presumably the Scotland Office are planning for a no deal um, as well. Uh, we know that a no deal would slash GDP by almost 8%, which would be a catastrophe for uh, the UK economy. But can you tell us, as Secretary of State for Scotland, tell the committee what areas of the Scottish economy are likely uh, to be at greatest risk from a no-deal Brexit, given that you're planning for a no-deal? Uh, well, I, I don't think, uh, you, to be fair, uh, Mr Bibby, you're, you're characterising it correctly. We are not, uh, we are not seeking a no-deal Brexit. We understand, as any um, responsible government would, that a no-deal Brexit is a possibility. Mm -hmm. uh, and therefore, it would be irresponsible uh, not to take contingency arrangements mm -hmm. uh, to uh, deal with that possibility, since uh, the point at which we leave the EU uh, is uh, only uh, months away. And that's why, over uh, the summer, uh, we have a, uh, produced a, a number of technical notices which relate uh, to areas of uh, both the economy and uh, civil society uh, that would require to, uh, which would require to, to make contingency arrangements, so that people have uh, uh, the ability to prepare a, uh, for a no deal, and there will be further uh, such notices uh, issued. But we are not uh, promoting a, a no deal because I recognise. Uh, and I've said, which I've said previously, that a no deal would not be good uh, for Scotland. And that's why I don't want to be in a position uh, of uh, a no deal. And when, if we get to the point, and I'm, I, I, as I've said to you, I remain confident uh, that we do, that Parliament gets the opportunity to vote for uh, the Chequers uh, deal or a no deal, I will be absolutely in uh, the uh, column of those voting for Chequers. And I would hope that the Labour Party and the SNP, if they genuinely don't want a no deal, would be doing likewise. You said you're not seeking a no deal. You've said you're not proposing no deal. But the Prime Minister yesterday, and you today have said, repeated that, have said you're planning for a no deal. Uh, you're making plans, contingency plans for a no deal. You said, you've also said that a no deal would not be good for Scotland. So if you're planning for a no deal for Scotland and you believe a no deal would, uh, would be bad for Scotland, can you tell us, the Secretary of State for Scotland, what areas of the economy will be hardest hit by a no deal? Well, in the interest of transparency, because I think people we've, and businesses need to know and fully understand in Scotland the impact of a no well, deal, that's given what, that it's becoming more likely. That, well, that's what the technical notices that have been published and will continue to be published about, about allowing people to prepare uh, for a, a no deal situation. But the no deal is a contingency because it is self-evident that if you are negotiating uh, a deal, one possible outcome is that there would not be a deal at the end of it, not because that was your aspiration or what you wanted to achieve. Now, my view is therefore that in order to avoid a no deal, 
what we need to be doing is putting our energies and focus into, uh, into trying uh, to get that deal and actually uh, to rally round uh, the Prime Minister in her negotiations. And I think if you know, we were united in the United Kingdom, uh, in Parliament, this Parliament and Westminster Parliament, in terms of our push uh, for a deal, that would strengthen the Prime Minister's hand in getting a deal. And that's, you know, for those people who want to avoid a no deal, that uh, is my, in my view, is the best way to do that. Rather, we, we can all, uh, you know, set out, you know, the worst case uh, uh, scenarios. We don't want, we don't want to be there. We want to be in a position where we've got a deal. Thanks very much, Convener. Uh, Mr Mandela, are you seriously asking us to believe that the, the Chequers proposal isn't a dead duck? Yes, I am. You're, I you, am. You, and can't I, get it, you can't get it past your own party. Your, you, your colleague, Rhys Mogg, said <coughs> Chequers is rubbish. Mr Barnier is reported in speaking to the German newspaper Frankfurter Zeitung that he was strongly opposed to Prime Minister May's Chequers proposal. Oh. And he even said the British offer in customs was... Illegal. I mean, are you expecting us to believe that Chequers is still alive and on the table? Chequers is still alive. It's still on Even the table. You've, I think, uh, as you've just set out, various comments are either attributed to Mr. Barney or he does, he, he does make certain statements. But Mr. Barney, Mr. Barney does not ultimately decide what the deal between the UK and the, and the 27 other uh, member states should be. That will be a, that will be an agreement uh, between the UK and those member states. And uh, as uh, Dominic Rabb set out yesterday in, in his uh, evidence in, in the UK Parliament, uh, you know nego negotiations uh, have been a, uh, proceeding on a, a constructive basis. Now, I don't suggest that the proposal that we've put forward will not require uh, the EU to make some. Uh, adjustments to the way in which it has uh, previously uh, operated, but uh, I think that we, ha you know, we, we have put forward a credible proposal which we should argue for. Mr Barney is the, the European Union's chief Brexit negotiator, and that's what he said. He basically said Chequers was a dead duck. He, well, he, he, he is reported to have made certain... Your own party uh, said he's, it's a dead he's reported to have made certain comments, but Mr Barney is not the final decision-maker in, in, in relation to these matters. And in relation you know, to reaching an agreement... I would, you know, this is, a, this is a negotiation between the United Kingdom and the EU. And I think it would be very good if everybody in the United Kingdom was on the side of the United Kingdom in those negotiations so that we can get the best possible deal for the United Kingdom and for Scotland. Tell us this, Mr Mundell. Tell, tell the committee and tell the people of Scotland here and now, will you support a no-deal or will you say quite clearly that you, you won't support it under any circumstances? I'm saying very clearly, and I've added, said it to Mr Bibby, if there is a vote in the House of Commons on checkers or no deal, I will be voting for checkers. And Mr Kofi, I'd like you to tell me that the SNP will be doing the same. Che checkers is not on the table. The European you, Union ruled that, it out. That is an assertion. You are assert you're asserting that based on newspaper... Uh, reports, not on being in the room within the discussions, not uh, having followed through you know, the various important events that are coming up, the Salzburg uh, meeting uh, of the EU27, the October Council of uh, EU uh, Council. These are the forums in which the decisions uh, will be made. So it, it, is, it is simply an assertion uh, that Chequers is uh, off the table. It is very much still on the table. Just, just tell us, finally, be clear that you will not support a no deal scenario under any circumstances. In the, in the I will not promote a no deal I scenario. I am very, I am, I am very clear no that scenario. I do not promote a no deal we know you don't scenario. I and I would, I would hope, you know, that SNP, Scottish Labour, Greens, 
uh, would also be in that position of not favouring a no-deal scenario in contradiction to the Prime Minister's a uh, position, because that seems to me to be exactly where you are. So if there's any people round uh, uh, this table who are favouring uh, a no-deal scenario, it is not me. You won't tell well, us well, that you I'll won't support a no-deal scenario. Yeah, yeah, you've tried hard, <laughs> tried hard. Um, <laughs> James. Okay. Thanks, convener. Uh, Mr Mundell, you've, you've made it clear that you want to see a deal. Uh, however, you've also acknowledged that it's a live possibility there could be a no deal, and you've said that the government are, you know, working on scenarios for that. Uh, just in terms of common frameworks and the funding arrangements which would flow from common frameworks being agreed, would they not? Would those funding arrangements, uh, the clarity of them, not be compromised uh, if there's a no deal? I, I don't. I don't think that they would be. Uh, no, I, I don't think they would be compromised um, as such. But I think there would have to be. There would. There would have to be, you know, clarifications, uh, urgent clarifications, as we, uh, if we were moving forward in that scenario. I mean, we've made it very clear, for example, in relation to agriculture, that the level of agricultural payments will continue until uh, 2022. We've made it clear that all existing um, EU. Um, funding arrangements that had been entered into at the point that we left uh, the EU uh, would be honoured. Uh, but clearly there are certain, uh, certain arrangements that might have to come into place in uh, 20, post-March 2019 that at the moment uh, you, the shed, would be scheduled to come into place uh, on the 1st of January 2021 at the end of the implementation period. So clearly there would need to be some uh, adjustment and clarification, but I don't think that there would be a threat to funding. And so, therefore, anybody who has received EU funding or is in the process of doing that up until the point of leaving, I don't think that they, they, they would need to be concerned about the continuation of that funding. But the, the examples you give are transitional arrangements, effectively. Um, but if we got into a situation where... Uh, there's no clarity around the, the rules or the basis on which, you know, we've left the EU. Uh, how can we then work out the funding arrangements going forward from the common frameworks? Well, the, the funding the, the funding arrangements um, in the in the medium to long term, you know, will be the subject for debate and and discussion. And to be fair to the Scottish uh, government. Uh, Fergus Ewing, for example, has, has issued various papers or, and, and discussions on the future of Scottish agriculture post-EU and how uh, agricultural support would be provided. Um, so there is going to be a debate and discussion in the future I, um, I, in, on, on, in relation to a whole uh, range of things. The UK government is going to bring forward a consultation uh, on uh, what we term as, as uh, the Shared Prosperity Fund, which is the, the replacement mechanism uh, for structural funding. So there will be uh, an opportunity to be debate and discussion as to what form uh, that, would, that would take. And I think people will welcome uh, those debates, because whilst most people I encounter have welcomed structural funding, they haven't necessarily welcomed the whole bureaucracy that's gone with it. So there will be changes in any event. If there was a shortened time period, uh, then uh, obviously that you know the, the things would have to be done in a in a, in a things would most likely be done in a shorter time uh, frame. But in terms of the actual funding as committed, there would be no change to that, whether or not there was a deal or no deal. Yeah, but in, you know, if we got into a situation where there, there is a no deal, you, you say there'll be various papers being issued, there'll be debate and discussion, but that debate and discussion uh, will lack, you know, clarity because we don't have any, we don't have the proper set of uh, rules set out for us leaving the EU. Well, we've set out in the, um, we've set out in the. Uh, in, in the technical uh, notices, uh, generally, um, what would happen, and the, the, 
the principal approach of that in, in those notices to date, and, and, and I'm sure will continue to be the case, is continuity, so that they, in general existing arrangements would, um, would remain in place. We've made commitments in relation to funding uh, as a... Uh, uh, as committed, so that no one, you know, who has a has a commitment of EU funding will, uh, will will lose out. We've gone beyond that in relation to agriculture to say that we'll continue the existing funding level to uh, 2022. But if if we left the EU with no deal, then discussions about new arrangements would take place in a shorter order. Mark, do I think you've got a question on no deal as well? Yeah, just... just, just. A, a, a brief follow-up, if I can, Convener, on, on, on no deal. Um, Secretary of State, I think you've been very clear that you see um, uh, the, the Chequers proposal is, is substantially uh, better than, than no deal. Uh, Mr Coffey, I think, was trying to invite you to say you ruled out no deal. There were no circumstances in which you would, you would accept that. Uh, I'm sure in your, your professional life you've been involved in negotiations, certainly in your life in politics you'll be involved in many negotiations. What, what impact would ruling out no deal have on the UK government's negotiating position in Europe? I, I think the Prime Minister's you know, been very clear from the start that it wasn't possible just simply to accept any proposal uh, that, that, that was put forward uh, by uh, the EU and uh, that's, that remains uh, the position, and I've been very clear. I mean, I could not accept a proposal that threatened the integrity of, of the United Kingdom, and some of the proposals that the EU have put forward have done that in terms of what they have suggested would be the arrangements uh, for Northern Ireland. And the, you know, that there, the, the, there is a, a point at which you cannot, you, we cannot accept. Uh, a, a proposal that would threaten the integrity of our, of our country. So that's why uh, uh, you know, we're clear that we're not going yeah. to uh, accept an arrangement on any terms. Yeah, so, so if, if we accepted that we would have to have a deal, yeah. all that does is undermine the opportunity we have as the United Kingdom to get the best possible deal with the EU. It just undermines our negotiating position. I yeah, I, I agree with that. Uh, analysis, but of course the other way in which a no deal could come about uh, is by opponents of the Prime Minister's position voting for that uh, in uh, Parliament, and that's why you know I would say to SNP MPs, Labour MPs, our Green MP, you know if they don't want no deal in Parliament, then they should vote for the deal that the Prime Minister brings forward. Thank you, Emma. Thank you, Convener. Quick clarification about the 2,500. Um, workers that would be seasonal is that for the whole of the uk it is for the whole of uk yes so what proportion would scotland have uh, would it be 10 percent? so that would it, it won't be, it won't be a fixed proportion it would be based really on the industry and, and, and as you're aware um a, a large proportion of the industry is in scotland so if we even got 10 percent, that would be 250 workers would that cover what we would need for our fruit grown season well it's it's it, it, it's not going to be uh, it, it's not going to be divided up in in that way of, of 250 for Scotland I mean it will be there'll be an opportunity for um, the industry to come forward uh, with a, um, a to apply for these uh, visas and you know it, it will be focused on uh, uh, on farms uh, but it will be for non EEA uh, um, residents and you know from my discussions with um, the horticultural industry in particular they, that, that was their requirement not that it would be because EU residents will be still able to uh, come and, and with the implementation period to, uh, they will be able to come until the end of 2020 this will be for non-EEA uh, workers and that you know that was the feedback I certainly had very strongly uh, from the industry in Scotland was the group of people they wanted additional people these would be additional people that would be able to come okay and uh, just a question about uh, a no deal as the uh, stories throughout the summer if we're planning for a no deal is that why we're encouraging people to stockpile medicines should we be doing that I mean I'm concerned um, that there's 28,000 type 1 diabetics in Scotland, many are pump users, and the supply chain associated with their, with their 
manufacturing distribution comes from Puerto Rico, Netherlands, um, other countries where everybody is, uh, I guess, dependent on the supply chain. Where all these, pro I have a constituent that contacted me because his anti seizure medicine comes from Denmark and uh, it's very specific, it has specific doses, patients are dose specific, and he's worried about his driver's license being maintained um, if he can't get his meds. So, is it a scared mongering story, or should we be asking people to, you know, stop? I, I, meds? Well, I, I think some newspaper reports have. Uh, uh, amounted to a uh, scaremongering. What the government's committed to doing, and, and working with the Scottish and working with the Scottish government and the, the NHS Scotland uh, are uh, closely involved in that, is making contingency uh, arrangements uh, to ensure uh, that there is a, a supply uh, of, of uh, drugs for your constituent uh, and for others. So at the level uh, of NHS Scotland, the, the NHS throughout the U United Kingdom, to make uh, sure that in the event of the no deal, that they had sufficient uh, medicines available, but not uh, to encourage individuals to, to stockpile, but to make sure that those, you know, those who would be providing or prescribing the medicines had sufficient medicines available. And that was the subject of a technical notice. Okay. It can I do the PGI one as well? or well, Very quickly. Okay. Um, I had concerns yesterday about protected geographical indicators uh, for food products, you know, and it's not just Scotland, it's the rest of the UK as well. Um, and First Minister announced £200,000 to promote Scotch lamb. And so if we're going to promote and protect the provenance of Scottish produce, would PGI status be part of the negotiations to protect that can you um, confirm that we can protect our pgi status for scottish produce our intention is that the existing arrangements uh, will remain exactly as they are with the with the eu uh, that in any uh, 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 future trade deals that we had uh, that we would have such arrangements and that we would also make arrangements uh, we would also make arrangements within our own uh, laws here in the Scotland United Kingdom uh, to ensure that protection, but we are determined to achieve that. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, for Secretary of State, for providing us with evidence this morning. Um, next week, I can confirm the Cabinet Secretary for Government, Business and Constitutional Relations will also be giving us evidence on the EU Withdrawal Act. Um, and with that, I close the meeting. Thank you.